Hey everyone, I'm Ben Norton of Multipolarista, and I'm joined by my co-hosts Aaron Good and Seamus McGinnis of the American Exception podcast. We are continuing the Empire and Deep State series. This is part 11, and this is the last kind of basically theoretical part. After this, we're going to be going through a history of the U.S. Empire and Deep State. Of course, this series is based on the book by historian and political scientist Aaron Good, who's joining us, and his book is called American Exception, Empire, and the Deep State. In the last part, part 10, we were revisiting the co theoretical conception of what is the deep state in more depth, because obviously it's very important to have that theoretical grounding before we get into the history. We're going to continue here talking more about what the deep state is, where power lies in the U.S. political and economic power apparatus, and what the U.S. empire is as well. And Aaron, I want to continue where we left off. And that is in your book, you bring up this concept of dark power. And you also go through conceptions of power from philosophers like Hannah Arendt. Can you talk about what that means? You know, it's, it's got like this kind of like Lord of the Rings sounding term, dark power, but it has a very specific meaning in terms of deep politics and understanding where power lies. Yes, so Anna, Hannah Arendt is famous as a kind of a, a liberal critic, especially of totalitarianism, you know, and uh, it, it, in that her, her ideas about totalitarianism are kind of convenient uh, and, and purposeable by the U.S. establishment to use to so that you can say, oh, yeah, Nazi Germany and uh, the Soviet Union, they're all this thing, and that thing is totalitarianism, and so they're kind of the same thing. Well, Aaron, I'm sorry to cut you off already, but we should point out that Hannah Arendt's work was also sponsored by the Congress for Cultural Freedom. I mean, they, they promoted her work, which was, of course, the CIA apparatus promoting what they called the compatible left, the non-communist or anti-communist left. Yeah, yeah that seems uh, that, that's that's totally reasonable because that's really what she was doing, this sort of left liberal perspective, but very anti-communist and in her case made it. Uh, pretty uh, an easy step to like equate Soviet communism with um, with fascism with Nazism, but some of her concepts, you know, she's she was a smart person, and her concepts are applicable to the U.S. system as well. I mean, this the whole idea of totalitarianism is that you have uh, a regime put in place that cannot be challenged by any element of civil society. Uh, but if you stop and think about it, that represents basically every civilization that has existed. I mean, a civilization is, has an organized sort of state of some some kind, right? That has a monopoly or, or some kind of control authority vested in it to control a certain territory and so on. And, and that it stays in place because no other element of civil society is able to supplant it. So, you know, to what extent is, is is every place totalitarian in that regard? It's kind of a tautology, right? If it wasn't able to totally control the society. I mean, I guess the idea is for liberals is that like, oh, no, it's the civil society that like actually, you know, controls the regime. But we know as people who are students of U.S. imperialism and the U.S. nation state that that's not really the case. So she, she wrote about how they were the, the part that's relevant to this discussion and dark power. She wrote about two kinds of power, of political power. Uh, persuasion through arguments, which you could call open power, you know, or you could call democratic power. Uh, so a, a way to arrive at a governance and for power to be exercised with more input and public deliberation and persuasion through arguments and an attempt to arrive at something close to consensus, uh, or at least something more consensual by and large. That's to be contrasted with this idea of dark power or coercion by force. Okay, and really no regime can totally run by, be run by coercion by force because it's very inefficient. But in a way, these are two ideal types. And she looks back at people like Thucydides and she makes this observation that uh, for the Athenians, uh, th this was how they handled domestic affairs, were, were more democratic, more like persuasion through arguments. But then externally, you have coercion by force, more violence. And if anybody has read Thucydides, you know, the famous uh, Athenian emissary who goes to like Mele Melian, the Melian dialogue, right? I think it's Melos. He goes to talk to these people who've been defeated. 
and uh, he's going to, you know, order the enslavement or murder of everybody, everybody there basically for not uh, being on the side of the Athenian empire. And he just says, you know, the strong do what they will and the weak suffer what they must. And this is, you know, pretty much encapsulating this idea of like this, the, the, the anarchy of, of foreign policy and the sort of brutality that's needed to run foreign policy to deal with external actors. Whereas internally, maybe you can be more democratic and have some kind of, you know, uh, deliberative process that uses persuasion, arguments, and so on. Okay, now, Sam Huntington, writing much after Hannah Arendt, he writes about this sort of idea of dark power, or things related to it, in a way, in ways where he's, you know, he's like supposedly this liberal political scientist guy, but he's, you know, more of like a kind of establishment imperial technocrat at the same time. I mean, this is what this is the kind of role he functions in U.S. political science and in the U.S. establishment. He was part of the Trilateral Commission, part of Jimmy Carter's administration, and so on. A uh, guy that wrote The Clash of Civilizations, right, which is in a way like kind of a wellspring of like neocon ideology. Um, but anyway, he talked about top-down coercive power uh, being necessary if you're going to have a cohesive society. He wrote, power remains strong when it remains in the dark. Exposed to sunlight, it begins to evaporate. And this is, you know, pretty much like uh, compatible with uh, the idea of like, uh, you know, the need for a deep state, more or less, that like this kind of power is better if it's like able to be exercised in ways that are covert, you know, the, that the power of the establishment is going to be better. And it's going to be better to have a cohesive society if power and the sort of dark side of power can be hidden from from people by and large. So Peter Del Scott writes about dark power and he defines it. As and he contrasts it with this like open, persuasive, democratic power. He contrasts it by defining dark power as power not derived from the Constitution, but outside and above it. And that is very relevant to understanding oligarchy and imperialism and uh, the American, the American deep state. So, Aaron, this idea of dark power is it something that that emerges in liberal democracies with what kind of political system? And and what is its role in in what's what is its relation to the way that you know the public state is organized? Right. The, the, this contrast between uh, open power and and sort of dark authoritarian power is something that goes way back in Western civilization. You know, the the Greeks are considered often the wellspring of like Western intellectual thought, and Plato wrote about some of these same issues, you know, the rule of law versus top-down rule, um, you know, and comparing those. And he is muddled in what he says about these things. If you've, We've talked a little bit about the Republic and how he uses Socrates to kind of make disingenuous arguments when really uh, he has to acknowledge that there's like a hierarchical society with myths that are there to sort of keep everybody in line in order to keep the city you know, running hierarchically like it's supposed to, right? He writes in this other section, this other work that he was working on when he died called The Laws. Um, he writes about this, this hypothetical, another hypothetical uh, city-state in his mind called Magnesia. And in Magnesia, you know, this book is called The Laws, and Magnesia is a place that is supposedly governed by these laws that are painstakingly formulated uh, to allow society to be run according to very um, well laid out and articulated rules and laws. But he also, in parts of it, writes about this idea of, noc of a nocturnal council, okay, which is made up of elites. And so this gets back to his other, you know, kind of favorite thing to talk about, which is the rule by the wise, rule by the wise. And th what they are doing in the in the laws is kind of unclear. They're supposed to do things like deal with atheists in the city. So people who start to question the gods and the prevailing myths of the city, um, the nocturnal council would have some way of dealing with them, which you have to, which sounds kind of coercive and begs further explanation, which Plato doesn't provide. And he died before he could finish this. Maybe the strain of trying to re reconcile these things is what finally did him in. But the other thing that the nocturnal council would do is um, that, that they were actually tasked with specifically in Plato's, you know, whole um, explanation of this is that they would handle and work with foreign travelers 
who come back with some dangerous new ideas that might be disruptive to the society, they're supposed to like deal with these guys. So I don't know what the analog would be for in our society, but if somebody like goes to Cuba and then comes back to the U.S. and starts saying that this whole private property thing is is a scam and we need to overthrow it, then maybe you know he'd be dealt with in some way. Who knows? But the idea is that these guys are are there to like maintain the the establishment perspective and, and its hegemony over over the society. And Plato calls them the real guardians of the laws. And he says, if such a divine council is created, then the state must be entrusted to it. People debate this. Uh, scholars who look at Plato, people who study the classics, debate this. And it's made more confusing because same, some translations are different and so on. And I don't think there's like a perfect agreed upon answer. But um, it, it can be debated as to whether he's, Plato was arguing for something informal or something formal uh, in the actual system. Is it an institutional institutionalized role or is it a kind of advisory role this is like a question that you could you could argue it either way now um if, if it's informal then it it could correspond to in our society something like the council on foreign relations right which is these establishment guys who've been vetted by the establishment and they get together write articles talk about the important issues of the day that need discussing for the people that manage the empire uh, you know, and it's there are going to be people who are loyal to the political economic elites because it's paid for by Wall Street. And so you're going to get a certain kind of like scholarship and wisdom and elite advice from this kind of entity. So is that what Plato was talking about? Possibly. Or is he talking about something a little scarier like uh, the Doomsday Project or, you know, the CIA, the national security state that has the ability to covertly intervene in uh, politics when need when the need arises? Okay, and this is like, so are they an exceptionalist kind of a entity? Like, are they there as the guardians of the state? Because so if if the laws themselves are not going to be able to resolve some particular conflict, then you just want to be able to have rule by the wise or dark power to intervene. So the conclusion that I come to here about it, the way I try to explain it and relate it to the deep state is in this passage here. Um. And it's, oh, I'll, I'll just read it. The general thrust of empire proceeds unimpeded, specifically the drive to global dominance and the dominance of wealth over society at large. As with Plato's Magnesia, U.S. elites benefit from the legitimacy conferred by democracy or you know, rule of law in the, in the Platonic case, while a deep state collectively functions as the nocturnal council to whom the city, i.e. the nation state, is really entrusted. In this way, U.S. oligarchs enjoy the benefit of living in a society with a considerable, if declining pretty rapidly, degree of democratic legitimacy while simultaneously retaining unacknowledged authoritarian agency. So by having this deep state system, you know, and having this democratic veneer, the they get to have their cake and eat it too. They get to pretend to be a, a democracy which has more legitimacy, but it's managed in a very top-down way. And there's probably no other way to run an empire than in a top-down fashion. And so this is where uh, we see these ideas, they go back, you know, they go back to the to the very beginnings of what we think of as Western civilization. Is the, what's the, how is, what's the relationship between power and the state? And can you have rule by law or is it always going to be rule by the wise? But that really just means like sort of top-down rule. It's really it's hard to understate how important that appearance of of democratic forms of of state power are and what kind of uh, hegemonic force and and just sort of creating this sense of normalcy about the state that democratic legitimacy gives to the people in power and the way that like we're talking about people like a rent that compatible left people are able to sort of do their work for them while ostensibly kind of speaking from the outside. So just because the U.S. can sort of have this nocturnal council that flies under the radar doesn't mean that they're not there. And if anything, it makes them all the more effective. So what parts of the American state best represent these this form of, of dark power? Yeah, I mean, if dark power is sort of fundamentally anti-democratic and is sort of the opposite of like public power or or 
you know, political uh, outcomes that would come about through public debate and so on, like C. Wright Mills was kind of holding up as something ideal or desirable. Then we got to look at those elements that allow for top-down rule in the United States, okay, and with the United States political system. So obviously, uh, the CIA, we talk about the CIA a lot, this ability to intervene uh, in a top-down fashion, uh, supposedly overseas, where we know they are involved in like, you know, getting involved with elections and assassinations and corrupting uh, civil society in other countries, uh, all the things that the CIA has, has done, which is an example of dark power in terms of running the empire, but then also they get involved domestically of Operation Chaos and uh, other and things like that, or FBI with COINTELPRO, uh, you know, uh, the top-down management of politics and control of politics, the sort of dark power, or the assertion of dark power. Uh, the continuity of government or the doomsday project is the would seem to be the darkest of dark power in the U.S. system because it's if, uh, initially created to deal with the potential for nuclear disaster, but it gets broadened to deal with other uh, unnamed threats to national security that might arise, which, so we don't really know how it operates, but you know, the details of it, because that's classified, but we know that they have expanded beyond nuclear war, that terrorism is a part of it, and that it was activated, uh, aspects of it were activated on 9-11, and that this is the power to, to, there's no way you can have an entity like this without it having some kind of sovereignty, like we talked about with, with Carl Schmidt, meaning that they decide when there is an emergency and they decide when there, when it is not an emergency. And so, uh, and we don't know what criteria they use. We don't know when they have even decided that there's an emergency. Uh, and, and this is a problem for democratic sense making. In a more benign or less frightening way, but but very real way, the foundations are sources of dark power. They can manipulate civil society and academia, and what we think of as like journalism, or, or in, in some ways, and, and just our understanding of a lot of events. And people, you know, they can hire people whose job it is to make sense of society, but they're only going they're going to be doing it as a as a vocation because they're employed by a think tank. Uh, and this, they, the foundations pay for this. So the foundations and the think tanks and the NGOs, all of this money that gets put around to influence like civil society, uh, this can be a source of dark power as well because it's you're talking about money that comes from these massive rentier fortunes of capitalists. You know, people who are monopolists, people who've made a whole lot of money. I mean, you, it's like Balzac said, right? The, the, behind every great fortune, there is an unforgotten crime. I mean, I would think that that applies to all of these foundations. And who is it that they give money to? Who is it that they give grants to, to do graduate work? You know, who endows chairs at universities? We've, we've talked about these things in different contexts, but they're a part, they have to be considered a, a form of dark power, of undemocratic power. And they uh, allow for the top-down management of, uh, of society. And we may not even know some of these elements that exist. Like I've talked, we talk about the doomsday machine and there's enough there to be alarmed about the powers that they have. Uh, Peter Dale Scott has talked in the past about uh, uh, the potential existence of another uh, government agency that's perhaps even more secretive and more overriding than the CIA. And he speculated that people like Joseph Alsop might have been a, a part of this. And uh, I, I think that that is a reasonable um, there's a little, there's uh, allusions to this in uh, Chaos, the book about the Manson case. You know, some of the people involved in there uh, seem to have connections and, and their relatives or people that was that were interviewed by Tom O'Neill say like, yeah, dad worked for some agency that was like really secret in the government. He would never even tell us what it was. So this is, this is something that we don't, it's, it's dark power. And then it's really, really dark power because we may not even know what kind of uh, agencies are set up in the government to be doing this sort of thing. Yeah. And Aaron, we're talking a lot about these structures, but sometimes it's also important to talk about the individuals who occupy those positions, right? We've mentioned the importance of people like Hoover and the FBI, the Dulles brothers in the CIA and state department. So when you're talking about dark power, who, who are the, some of the individuals that work in this particular you know, murky area of the state? Well, I have a definition here that I can show you. And this comes from my dear friend and mentor, Lance DeHaven Smith, 
but he uh, he coins this term the guardian elite, and it's it's a mixture of Plato's idea of the guardian class and C. Wright Mill's power elite. This was the inspiration for Lance when he he wrote about this, and he defines the guardian elite as high-ranking officials who are privy to state secrets, who decide what the public may and may not know, and who plan and authorize covert operations, foreign and domestic surveillance, and other espionage and intelligence activities. And so this is uh, this gets into trying to uh, the sociology of the deep state, which is not an exact science here because a lot of it is obscured. But I, I, try, I came up with, I don't want to call it a taxonomy because I don't really think that this is a perfect way to like put people into different categories. But the Guardian elite, you know, people like let's say somebody like James McCord, James Angleton, people who have these very sensitive positions in the national security state, we could think of them as conforming to uh, the definition of the guardian elite that Lance DeHaven Smith puts out. I also talk about deep statesmen at, at one or two points in the book, and I don't spend a whole lot of time on this, but it's an interesting thing to even to, to think about. People that are active in the realm of controlling, you know, uh, grand strategy and foreign policy in different ways uh, and are, you know, somewhat visible in their, with their, the way they pop up in U.S. history and in U.S. politics. Um, and so you could think of these people as deep statesmen. So somebody like Dean Acheson, right, who was, who seemed to have played key roles in setting up the post-war U.S. empire, okay, like, setting up um, containment, enshrining containment as official policy, and then going even further with that. Uh, because George Kennan is the guy who more or less wrote the containment manifesto uh, in a dispatch from the Soviet Union, from Moscow and the State Department. And he was Acheson's underling. And then Acheson's other underling, uh, his subordinate, um, Paul Nitza, writes NSC 68, presumably at uh, Acheson's um, you know, direction. And so, so you know, this is uh, this is not a position that's explained in the Constitution. This is like dark power. It's outside and above the Constitution for people to have this kind of of power and to formulate these sort of important policies without public debate or real transparency as to how these strategies were arrived at. Somebody like Avril Harriman, right? Uh, he's he was at used as an ambassador and diplomat and fixer for the Democratic Party. In different ways and he kind of straddles this realm between like a deep statesman and uh, the oligarchy which i'll say more about in a minute uh, joseph alsop who was at the new york times and um was uh at uh i think at yale for a while too i mean he has all th these eastern establishment guys um that are very that, that pop up again and again and alsop was involved in all sorts of chicanery around the vietnam war and seemed to be like trying to start the vietnam war um, and wanted to start, a, almost started a war in Laos under uh, uh, that Kennedy was pressured to undertake, and that didn't happen. So he's a pretty serious and kind of nefarious character. He's also one of the people involved in creating the Warren Commission. So the Warren Commission, after Kennedy's executed, Alsop is one of the people that works really hard to lobby LBJ to create this Warren Commission. And it emerges eventually that this was at the direction of Dean Acheson. So who are these people, right? Henry Kissinger is another one. He's a Rockefeller man, big formulator of U.S. foreign policy and of the U.S. empire. Brzezinski, also a Rockefeller man, uh, was at Columbia University. You know, Brzezinski was at Harvard. Um, so the, this, this connection between like the Rockefellers, the Ivy Leagues, and then the national security policy making decision, this is really relevant to understand these people. Dick Cheney, you know, when he was out of government, in the 19, in the 70s, he was a part of like dealing with the church committee and these other investigations, stonewalling them and controlling what gets out about the intelligence agencies. In the 80s, he was a right wing congressman. He wrote this dissent about the Iran Contra report, basically arguing that the, the executive should have more power to conduct foreign policy however he wants with no legal restraints. And then in the 90s, Dick Cheney's involved in drafting continuity of government plans with Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, and they're this right wing sort of cabal in the in the Clinton administration that's not got much input from Clinton or, or oversight. And they plan and they're these right wingers who are more militarists and they're complaining about the Clintons and their foreign policy. And they're setting up continuity of government plans while they're out of government. Like uh, this is Cheney's like a CEO. And so is Rumsfeld at this time. And they're working together on this. 
uh, people like Richard Pearl, Robert Rubin, the people that have to seem to have more power and that pop up again and again, and their power seems to go beyond what the actual positions are that they hold. So these are, I think of these as deep statesmen. And on a higher level, presumably, are what we could call like the oligarchs, okay? People like David Rockefeller, in the, he's the most obvious guy of the U.S. empire up until his you know death or re, sort of gradual retirement from public life. But he's involved in getting Reagan elected, in getting Jimmy Carter elected, and then having Jimmy Carter lose. He had these public debates with JFK and uh, I think it was Fortune or Life magazine where they had these arguments about the, the economy. Um, he was uh, had all the Shaw's money, you know, he persuade uh, in his Chase Manhattan Bank. His Council on Foreign Relations more or less formulated U.S. foreign policy. They had their. It's hard to say how much money the Rockefellers are actually in control of still because it's tied up in all these foundations and who really knows. But Standard Oil and the way that it got broken up, and the U.S. oil majors, like they they must represent enormous amounts of money. And I would guess that they have so much power that like they have managed to create a web of corporate you know, holding companies and other obscurantist uh, you know uh, formations so that we don't even know how much money they really have who knows but uh larry fink the guy that runs blackrock that's that represents an enormous concentration of power so is he would he should he be considered part of the oligarchy i, I think so bill gates you know i mean look at bill gates and how he's like head of this this monopoly he's a monopolist i mean like he's like uh the standard oil of the personal computer right and that's when he makes all his money and that's not enough for him. So then he wants to like have a corporate takeover of education, if you recall. Like he wants to turn that into a massive rent seeking stream for himself. He wants to control pharmaceutical vaccine, you know, uh, patents and all these other things to ba for, pay, have everybody giving him money for vaccines when they used to give him money for windows, right? Or for, for education. He would like them, he would like everybody that wants to get educated to like have to, you know, pay some sort of corporation right this is like the these guys this is the oligarchy they just look for like where can we suck up more and more wealth where how can we make society into just a series of everything we want everything to be a series of rackets that suck money up to us and now gates is like i think he's he might have backed off some of the vaccine stuff and is now this huge he's like the biggest landowner in the united states right i mean this is where the constitution of the united states puts limits on what the government can do right on the um, limits to government power to so limit you could which you could also call limits to public power there's very little to limit private power in the united states and that's the you know recurring disaster of our of our system uh bezos today with the washington post and amazon and whole foods and all the other things he's bought up he would be part of the oligarchy and there's other weird characters that you don't even really know where to put them uh, they are these strange money men that pop up in this system and represent dark power, like Yoshio Kodama, who was Yakuza and then Japanese Navy and then became involved in the Lockheed bribery scandal. Uh, CIA sprang him from jail. He should have been executed after World War II, but he set up the ruling party of Japan with like $175 million in stolen uh, loot from the Chinese. And uh, then he was used as like a CIA fixer until the scandal broke out in the 1970s. Uh, you know, the Lockheed bribery scandal is what it was called, where they would just bribe people to uh, do this that the CIA wanted bribed. And he was their bag man. Uh, TV Soon, who went, you know, part of this whole milieu of nationalist Chinese. And he was considered the richest man for a while. But most of his money came from like US aid and other, you know, efforts to the connections between the US and the nationalist Chinese. Khashoggi runs around with his yacht, seems to be involved in like sexual blackmail and all sorts of other shady operations for the American deep state, like Iran Contra sets up the Safari Club to be the CIA in exile, more or less. Uh, Epstein, how do we explain Epstein? He's another guy who seems clearly to be involved in sexual blackmail, but also put a lot of a huge amount of money into other strange areas as well. So you know, this isn't a way to perfectly categorize all the people that are deep state figures, but there's these people do not really have, there's not a way to explain the power of these actors with reference to liberal de democracy or the way that we're led to believe it functions. And from there, how can we factor in the idea of exceptionism here? 
Well, with the the exception and this ability to override any legal restraints, I mean, this is extremely relevant to understanding the differences between demo, de democratic myth and imperial reality. I mentioned in the book um, how, and I, and I talked about this a minute ago because it's just this thing that sums up so much in in, in our in our history and our civilizational history. Anyway, the Athenian saying strong do what they will and the weak do what they must. And that seems anachronistic or something to, to, to sort of put that out now or think that that's a way of operating in the present day. But compare that to like Hillary, you know, Hillary Clinton saying we came, we saw he died uh, after this head of state of a socialist country, you know, got sodomized with a bayonet and shot and put on YouTube uh, with these US backed forces did this and Hillary's laughing about it. Um, so this is, uh, this is just part of the um, the reality of being an empire. And now, and some people do try to take this up uh, and be honest about it or sort of honest about it. So I've got a quote here from Leo Strauss, um, who was a, a intellectual inspiration for a, a certain neoconservatives like Paul Wolfowitz. He was at University of Chicago for a long time. And he actually was had a connection to Strauss um, not Strauss, but Carl Schmidt, you know, the Nazi guy um, who helped to get him established uh, as an academic. But Leo Strauss wrote, are the maxims of foreign policy essentially different from the maxims on which gangs of robbers act? Can they be different? Are cities not compelled to use force and fraud to take away from other cities what belongs to the latter if they are to prosper? Do they not come into being by usurping a part of the Earth's surface, which by nature belongs equally to all others? Now, you could take that same argument and make it into a kind of Marxist argument about the, you know, illegitimacy of the uh, property relations of the of the state and the need for, you know, reform and, and, and revolution to escape these kind of uh, dynamics. But I, Strauss didn't do that. Strauss was not of that mindset. So he was more saying that he's asking these questions because that's a way to avoid kind of saying outright what he's really saying. I would think that's my, that's the reasonable interpretation, especially when you know who his actual followers were, people like Wolfowitz and so on. So it's really, he's saying that, you know, foreign policy is, is gangster business. I mean, that's a, this is as good a way of summing up as anything. And this is, pretty relevant is this what you're thinking like oh yeah of course they're not going to entertain the idea of international law and if you have this mindset it's something that you can use to justify just about anything but if it's a liberal democracy then you you can't go around saying this this is why strauss puts it in the form of a question and other people come up with you know different nonsense to obscure the reality of it one of them i have a tweet here i don't necessarily think tweets are the highest form of discourse but here is the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. So the Council on Foreign Relations is still around, still out there perpetrating elite mischief. Uh, Richard Haas is their president, and he wrote this. This is this, there's so much here in this in the, the little few amount of the small amount of characters you get in a tweet, but it, it's worth really looking at. International order for four centuries has been based on non-interference in the internal <laughs> affairs of others and respect for sovereignty. Russia has violated this norm by seizing Crimea, Crimea and by interfering in the 2016 U.S. election. We must deal with Putin's Russia as the rogue state it is. Aaron, I, I just, I, I sorry to cut you off, but it, it, were, it would be one thing if he were to claim that the international order for 60 years or 70 years was based on non-interference, talking about the unipolar moment of, you know, well, before the unipolar moment, talking about the Bretton Woods system, the creation of the United Nations, this Pax Americana idea. But for four centuries, just erasing British colonialism, French colonialism, German colonialism, U.S. genocidal Western expansionism. I mean, it's incredible seeing that. Yeah, this dude is, uh, he was, when he wrote this, he was the king of, of, of whiteness on this day, I think, if there could be such a thing. I mean, this is the what the whitest white dude imperialist tweet I can imagine because he's he you you wonder really how much he actually believes this, but yes, as to for four centuries. Well, you know, since people mark the 
colonization of like, you know, Puerto Rico is considered like the world's oldest uh, colony. And that that kind of kicks off this whole era of the majority of the globe being subjected to exactly the opposite of what he is saying. It's the exact opposite. He could really say international order for four centuries has been based on interference in the internal affairs of others and a disrespect for sovereignty. Uh, it, it really yeah. is incredible because usually these figures, they actually try to distinguish the U.S. empire from European empires. And they try to say that the difference between the U.S. empire is that the U.S. imperial order from World War II forward, the end of World War II, has been characterized by supposed respect for sovereignty. But now he's trying to say that the entire European colonial era was also predicated in respect for sovereignty. I've, I've never even seen anyone argue that before. This is, I don't even think the, the most diehard European colonialists would argue that. They would say that, yes, we violated the sovereignty of India, but it was in the, the Indian people's self-interest. Right. I mean, this, this one is really very strange. This is one where I think like if John Bolton was about to tweet this, he'd be like, I think I got to hold back. I don't know why he tweeted this, to be honest. But it gets, that's not, you know, there's, the whole thing, full top to bottom, it's insane. He says, Russia has violated this norm by seizing Crimea. Well, that's a weird kind of case. The Crimeans had voted even before 2014 to like try to rejoin Russia. And it was clear that that's what they wanted. But the Russian case is kind of, you know, questionable. So whatever, just set that aside. But if you're talking about Russia seizing Crimea and violating this norm, obviously the U.S. staged a coup right before this and was interfering in the internal affairs and, and negating the sovereignty of Ukraine, which is what precipitated the Crimean secession and uh, annexation, you know, however you, whatever terms you want to use to describe it. Additionally, the interference in the 2016 election, well, that's mostly been shown to have been, you know, in, ineffectual and not, not to be connect, proven to be connected to the Russian state at all, to the extent that there even was much interference, which it doesn't seem like there was much at all. Uh, and that most of those things have turned out to be bogus or, you know, and discredited, even if you can't prove a negative by and large, right? But additionally, the U.S. did interfere in Russia's elections and put it on the cover of Time magazine. So it's like really undisputed that the U.S. did this. So overall, this is just, this is like, uh, this is deep, this is deep power. This is the ability of people in positions of power to be able to, uh, pretend to have their democratic cake and like eat the dictatorial cake too, or however you want to say it. I mean, this is like, it, it, it's so absurd on its face. And yet it's not like there were calls for his resignation for saying like outrageous and ridiculous things. This is just what they want to say. It's the rules-based liberal international order, which really just means reality is what we say it is. And you have to do what we say. Yeah, I, I know, Seamus, that you wanted to jump in, in, in with a question. But before you do, I just want to, can, can you go back, Aaron, to that slide you had of the quote before Haas? And from Leo Strauss here, Th this Leo Strauss quote, I think uh, it really represents uh, the, the criminality is at the heart of imperialism. And this is confirming the thesis of your book about American exceptionism and all of that. And when I saw that quote, it immediately made me think of War is a Racket by Smedley Butler, who has a very similar quote, of course, as someone who was w one of the top U.S. military officers, major general of the Marine Corps. He has this famous uh, quote about War is a Racket. And of course, he wrote that, that extended essay, War is a Racket. But I mean... This sounds so similar to the Strauss quote. At the end, he says, he said, during those years when he's talking about, you know, U.S., uh, basically neocolonialism, he said, I helped the, ban the, help banana, the banana wars and other things in the early part of the 20th century. Absolutely. Yeah. He, he talks about, you know, uh, helping to uh, turn Mexico, Haiti and Cuba basically into colonies of the U.S., uh, Nicaragua, China. I mean, his writings are so revealing. He, he says he was a gangster for capitalism. And he said, you know, I spent most of my time being a high class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and for the bankers. And then he says, I feel I could have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. So, I mean, 
if you just compare that to this quote from Leo Stra Strauss, of course, they're coming from different angles. Smedley Butler became a socialist and anti-imperialist, but they're basically acknowledging the same thing. Of course, Strauss is just defending it. Right. In an oblique way, without really owning up to it. He's just putting it out there. He's basically saying you're gonna you need to be a gangster in foreign policy. It's similar to, to Thomas Hobbes. It's a dangerous, it's a dangerous world out there, and uh, there's nobody to protect you. So you just have to become as powerful as possible. You're you're compelled to do that. And this is a way to explain foreign policy in the in a, in, under imperial capitalism and under human civilization in general. It kind of deals with the it gets to the conundrum of human civilization. Uh, but there's, you know, it's it's socialism and the enlightenment that should lead people to think, can we transcend this? Right. And then the anti enlightenment thinkers like Leo Strauss um, would, would say no. And the people in power in the United States would say no. But they would in the in the United States, they would talk out of both sides of their mouth. They would want to pretend to uphold enlightenment values and the rule of law, even as they act like gangsters uh, and then lie about it. Strauss is yeah. a good representation of the sort of wisdom of the moment now, but uh, I mean, even just going beyond neocons, uh, people like Mearsheimer talk about this idea of like great power politics being sort of the justification for for actions on the international stage he'd nowadays. Say, he'd think. say explanation instead of justification, but yeah. So the, the explanation that they give then, um, uh, you know, just that concept of great power politics is an invention of realist theorists that are specifically justifying empire and and sorry or explaining empire that um, that it gives like that framework of foreign policy analysis tends to be built on the assumption that countries have these like quote unquote spheres of influence again came out of the late British Empire and and the idea of that gave rise to World War One because of these conflicting spheres among the European powers. So th these things have have been, gone on through time and have evolved. But when you hear people justifying or explaining things via sort of the the refrain back to this is what you have to do as a state on the international stage, it is the same thing as Strauss coming right out and saying what in the end all of the the ruling class believes at heart even if they sort of ascribe to some higher like you're saying sort of enlightenment uh morality that is able to help them either sleep at night or sell themselves as something more liberal than they really are yeah i mean these, these it's interesting when they say the things outright that more or less conform to what i argue like there's the henry kissinger quote where he says the illegal we do right away the unconstitutional takes a little bit longer. So if that's coming from Kissinger, then like, what does that tell you? It's like, this, they say it themselves. I mean, and we know Leo Strauss putting this stuff out here that he's an he's a guy who had huge influence over the neocons. Um, and so we know that we know that this is how they operate. And at times they even admit it. So this is really remarkable. Uh, and another remarkable thing in, the, in a similar vein, um, I've got this, this is, we'll get past the tweet uh, from Haas. And uh, I'll play this clip from James Clapper, uh, thanks to Ben Norton's report from the Real News Network years ago, uh, which <laughs> coincidentally, I just Googled it and I played it. And I was like, I think that sounds like sounds like somebody I know. And then I got to the end and he, he, it's finally he says, like, this is Ben Norton. So this is funny. But I don't know if we'll get to we're not going to get to that point. But I want you, you got to hear James Woolsey talk about U.S. meddling in other countries' elections because it's priceless. Have we ever tried to meddle in other countries' elections? Oh, probably, but uh, it was for the good of the system in order to avoid the communists from taking yeah. over. For example, in Europe, uh, uh, in 47, 48, 49, uh, the Greeks and the Italians, we... We don't do CIA, that now, though. We don't mess around other people's well, elections, Joe. Yeah. Mm, nom, 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 nom. <laughs> <laughs> Only for a very good Can cause. Can you do that? Do a Vine video on a former CIA director. Only really. for a very good cause in okay. the interest of democracy. All right, thanks for being here. It's always great to see you. Well, so there you go. Only I mean, for the very good causes. Sure. <laughs> Yeah. Can you imagine so, asking like Alan Dulles, did you, did, you know, did you have the president killed? Um, yum, 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 yum. <laughs> it was yeah, a good reason. Is, I mean, it's funny that she just laughs about it. It's like, I mean, I get, it's known that the U S is hypocritical and such, but it's like, you, 
they they're they're like kind of laughing but you I mean, you wonder why she would even ask the question is she an idiot like did she just forget that like this goes on or did she expect him to lie or what was she even thinking because that wasn't very good propaganda uh from a propaganda outlet <laughs> but there it is one of those weird cases where like okay i'm on we're on the same page me and these guys it's just they actually think it's good uh, and i and i sort of elaborate on how it sucks yeah aaron we've been talking about this concept of dark power and what's interesting to me is that if you believed in this myth of liberalism and the, and the rules-based international order and all of that the argument would be that well this concept of dark power would only be a, applicable to so-called authoritarian regimes. But the examples we're all talking about today are in the United States, which portrays itself as this great benevolent liberal democracy that portrays itself as the model for the world politically. So what is the relationship between liberalism and dark power? Well, if you look at some of the practitioners of dark power, they will, um, in the U.S. setting, they they need to pay they need to pay tribute like um, like Richard like Haas was doing in that tweet. They pay tribute to these ideals of liberalism, and uh, even it, it's very strange. They actually instrumentalize this. I'm going to go a little further than I did in the in the book here. And um, there's this quote from Brzezinski that uh, is is very interesting, and it's kind of he's sort of talking about the potential for like you know uh, open power. Uh, or democratic power to emerge. And the context of this is fascinating when you think about it, but I'll try to elaborate on this. So Brzezinski said in a speech in May of 2010, for the first time in human history, almost all of humanity is politically activated, politically conscious and politically interactive. Uh, global <laughs> activism is generating a surge in the quest for cultural respect and economic opportunity in a world scarred by memories of colonial or imperial domination. That's, that's the best Brzezinski impression I can do. Uh, and that's sort of how he talks, in my in my opinion. You, so, you have to get the accent of a uh, of, of a Polish aristocrat who would be like a two hundred years ago would have been like a prince or some kind of like colonial, uh, you know, overlord. Yep, yep. It would have been like a uh, some sort of viceroy of something, something. <laughs> but uh, and it's funny that uh, we, we, we may have mentioned this before, but Peter Dale Scott was in a seminar with like two other students and one of them was Brzezinski when he went to McGill uh, and they dated the same uh, or, or Brzezinski dated someone that Peter had dated beforehand, which is very funny. But what, to get back to the statement of Brzezinski saying this, like at the time people like maybe even people like Alex Jones, I, I remember we're talking about this and being like, but the elites are scared. They're running scared. People are waking up. They're talking about a global awakening. Right. But then you look back at it. And you see what happens after this, a few months, is the Arab Spring. And I, my guess on this, which I can't prove that this is true, but I would guess that they knew about this Arab Spring business. Uh, and Brzezinski would have been in the circles of people. You know, he's retired and pretty old at this point. But like, these were the kind of things he was into because he was the guy who formulated like the Arc of Crisis strategy of using the Muslim populations to destabilize the Soviet Union you know, with Afghanistan and even giving money to people like Hekmatyar even earlier in the 70s. These were like Brzezinski ideas. So he says this. And then a few months later, you have the Arab Spring, which what what impact did the, that all of those things have the Arab Spring? I mean, now to me, they look a lot like color revolutions in the way that they unfolded and with a lot of help from Google and Facebook you know, like you had Arab, you know, Egyptian liberals naming their kids Facebook, whatever, which is very strange. But they like were so thankful for this. Yeah, those Twitter accounts in Libya around this time that all came out of nowhere, very similar to the army of like Ukraine uh, trolls that like want to spam you with all this these Ukraine war uh, talking points. So uh, you know, yeah, I would NAFO, I would think <laughs> this is the latest example of that, which is so clearly astroturfed. Completely. I mean, yeah, it, it's like I, I almost I don't feel like they're even worthy of making fun of for very long because they're just, it's so ridiculous. But um, but Brzezinski puts this out there: the Arab Spring unfolds, and you, then you start to see how the liberal the Arab Spring represents one of these themes in in U.S. foreign policy and U.S. imperialism, which is weaponizing. Uh, liberal rhetoric to, in order to um, 
in order in, in order to have top down right wing illiberal policies. Okay, so what does the Arab Spring really give people after all of these uh, uprisings? I mean, the more the most tangible consequences were the destruction of Libya, you know, a, a, the destruction of a prosperous socialist state, and then a war in Syria that they are very 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 invested in. Okay, we know that. Uh, I mean, that was that was made with reference to the Arab Spring. It was the sort of initial cause for like case to be made for supporting uh, these rebels in Syria and being against the Syrian government. It was like part of the like people rising up. But then it's all working out to the benefit of the United States. And, and so this is an example of how this liberal liberalism can you it can utilize the uh, legitimacy of open power. Uh, democratic processes in order to advance their imperialist goals. They can weaponize most everything. And this uh, is, you know, dark power is a way to overcome problems for liberal imperial hegemony, okay? Because there's a there's the U.S. moral code, which some people might scoff at the notion of that, but like, you know, realistically, we're supposed to like tell the truth and be like a quote unquote Christian country you know, problematic, but there's still like this idea that people want to at least pretend to adhere to, right? And then there's global meta norms about like the respect for sovereignty. So you see Haas in that tweet, as bad as it is, at least he is paying tribute to these ideas. And there's like the rule of law, there's international law and, and treaties that the US has signed. And so how are you going to deal with these, these things if you're supposedly this liberal country? And exceptionism, the ability to um, you know, use dark power to act decisively. Uh, this is a way to overcome uh, the constraints that liberalism, uh, you know, presents. And we see that those constraints are very weak indeed, because they don't do much to restrain uh, the conduct of foreign policy. They don't do much to restrain imperialism up to this point. So we've talked a little bit before about Thomas Hobbes, who was a uh, an English philosopher. He wrote Leviathan. So we've talked about that a little bit. He was sort of in uh, like pro absolutist monarchy, and um, and that tends to get juxtaposed with a later writer, John Locke, who is sort of a, an intellectual forefather of American democracy. Um, on that sort of the the supposed spectrum between Hobbes and Locke. We tend to teach our kids that that America falls fully in the lock camp and that there's this sort of legitimated democracy that that or we're talking about legitimacy in terms of ideology here, that it's legitimated by the support of the people and that somehow power is is not just arbitrarily given to the state. But with what we're talking about, we're talking about things and, and the situated power and material wealth of the country being fully in the hands of people who are unelected, who get to, if they're not making every decision, they can veto anything that they that they need to. And all of that largely is, is just across the board illiberal. And what people like Woolsey on that clip are describing is illiberal intervention abroad that is contradicting what the head of the Council on Foreign Relations is trying to say as the sort of the party line of, of, of both sides, of, you know, of our party line. But um, but they're contradicting each other. And in reality or in practice, we see that the deep state acts repeatedly to uh, to illiberal ends. So what how how do we situate this in terms of of the philosophy that is supposed to ground liberalism in some sort of legitimacy? Well, this gets into, you know, political theory 101, which I enjoyed at uh, the university. And Hobbes is the guy that was described by my professor, um, Jeff Isaac, who's a really brilliant guy. He's more of a liberal than me, so we don't see eye to eye so on a lot of things these days. But he's a really smart guy, and he explained all these things in ways that were very helpful to me as I went forward and studied anything else I went to study in politics. Uh, Thomas Hobbes grew what was grew up in the English Civil War, and it was a really terrible time, and this shaped his political view. And he made the argument uh, that you needed to like submit to the authority of the king. But the reason he's considered like a, a modernist or a modern thinker is that he wasn't saying you need to submit to the authority of the king because of the divine right of kings, because of, uh, you know, God ordains the king. He says you need a sovereign, okay? Because life without a sovereign, life without civilization or the state is nasty, brutish, and short. 
And so you need the sovereign to be there to maintain control over uh, society and manage things because it's a dangerous world out there and it would be a dangerous world you know, in here internally without the sovereign. So obey the sovereign because it's in your interest to do so, not because there's any divine right. Okay, and that was radical if you can believe it for the time. He was an absolutist and yet it was still considered you know, kind of radical because he was saying, obey the king, but not because God says so, but because it makes sense. Well, and if I could jump in, Aaron, and as as a rationalist, his argument was also that the the monarch, the sovereign, would then do act, act in a way that follows reason, and his political actions would be informed by what's rational for society. Right, right. Not 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 what God says is best, but this this fetishization of you know this this idea that like a uh, you know politics can just be rooted in what's logical and rational. You know, it's, it's actually kind of similar. It's like the Ben Shapiro worldview, right? Like uh, uh, facts and logic and reason, which is often irrational and illogical. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to say I'm not, I could not even try to define the Ben Shapiro worldview. I've only heard him in small snippets and uh, he seems so aggressively stupid to me that I, I couldn't do more. So I tip my cap to you for waiting in enough to be able to even say what his worldview would be because I, I couldn't, I couldn't take it. So props to you for that um yeah he he's there are other philosophers that i mean that look into these areas uh and they are as liberalism emerges as the enlightenment emerges you have people that are supposed to be different than this but uh the state itself is is problematic especially in the west um the the idea of the legitimacy of the state and then the state's monopoly on violence and that it's accepted, this is complicated by the fact that, as Charles Tilley points out, American social scientist, you know, of Cold War era, um, he's writing in the 70s mostly, um, he writes that uh, the organizations from the, that the modern state developed from were basically like protection rackets, okay? This through, and through war making uh, that, and the, the alliance with the emerging bourgeoisie that the protection racketeers that, that ran the states, they evolved. So Tilly's famous quote is, war made the state and the state made war. Um, so the modern state emerged from institutionalized, illegitimate violence, these protection rackets, um, but they become complex enough to basically allow societies to better organize for violence internally and externally. And then the, the sort of the Western state as it develops becomes copied by other states in the area. And this is used as a you know, part of European warfare and the way that European capitalism and warfare and imperial expansion uh, unfold. So this, is, this, this, I, this idea of violence and illegitimate violence and top-down violence, this is like a huge part of Western civilization. Now, John Locke is the liberal guy who is credited as having the biggest influence on the founders of the United States of America. So he's life, liberty, and property, right? This gets changed into like life, uh, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, okay? Because property is problematic if you're trying to sell this to people, but that's where it comes from. And he believed that the best way to secure uh, life, liberty, and property is through an elected legislature. But he also wrote about the need to have executive power, uh, the authority to act decisively in the public interest. And he wrote that this, which is potentially, you know, a, a very close to the kind of uh, despotism that he was against when it was exercised by the crown. Uh, so this, he, he wrote, accidents may happen wherein a strict and rigid observation of the laws may do harm. And he even uses the term prerogative to describe this discretionary power uh, that the executive would have. And he says it in passing in his book that this is arbitrary power, okay, which is supposed to be exactly what he is railing against and, you know, expounding, uh, you know, the, the problems of. So he, um, he talks about prerogative powers and how, well, here, I'll, I'll just, there's a quote here, I'll read it. The question is, what do you do if there's an executive who is abusing this power? And he writes, but who shall judge when this power is made right use of? Okay, Locke answers that if the legislature is unable to check the prerogatives of an executive, quote, there can be no judge on earth. Okay, in such an instance, a ruler is using a power that was never his, and since people cannot consent to the rule of those who would harm them, 
um, you know, this is this is why the power was never his. People can't allow consent to this, really. This is not something that would be legitimate. But what do you do if it's actually happening? Under such circumstances, the people are to make an appeal to heaven at the opportune moment, which is just another way of saying that the people have the right to revolt. So even John Locke, this liberal, you know, paragon says that, well, you need to empower the executive to act, you know, decisively and ignore laws if it's in the public interest. What are you going to do if he's saying that it's in the public interest, but it's really not? Well, not much you can do. An appeal to heaven. You just revolt, I guess, is what you do. So it's like this conundrum. Um, so I, I summarize this saying, by not defining the, the boundaries of prerogative power, Locke liberalized and thus legitimized what is essentially a foundation for absolutism. I mean, you can argue he comes down more or less on the same side as Hobbes on these issues. It's just that he has different points of emphasis. Uh, this is a guy named Neo Cleus. Uh, I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong, but he's a political theory guy. He wrote a great paper on this, and I think it's it's dead on. And it's a uh, it's, so it's a problem at the heart of liberalism. Your th there's no way to completely deal with the executive the executive of the state, the head of state, and the potential for emergency situations uh, while retaining uh, the rule of law in, in, a, in the way that liberalism tries to prescribe. And it gets into the, a guy who is considered like this very illiberal person, but who you could also argue is more or less like taking Locke's ideas and adapting them to you know, real world circumstances so Carl Schmitt was writing around the time of the Weimar Republic, time of crisis for the German people. And he's famous for saying, sovereign is he who decides the exception. So I've got a few quotes here from Carl Schmitt, who we've talked about before, but he's, you, you, it's, we're living in a Schmittian world more than we want to admit. But he was a Nazi. Nice touch with the, the frowny, smiley face. Well, I don't just want to throw a swastika up there without putting some indication that I disapprove yeah. of the swastika. So I even you noticed the smiley, the, the frown face is even bigger just to show my frowny, my frowny uh, position towards <laughs> Nazism. Good call. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm bravely taking that anti-Nazi stand. So he wrote sovereign among, among the U S ruling class, increasingly brave an increasingly brave stance against Nazism. Yeah. When we go back and look Especially at in it, Ukraine. Yeah. You got, you get, a, Talk about exceptions. You got to make the exception for Ukrainian Nazis. Anyway, <laughs> if you look back more at what the U.S. was doing post World War II, they, they their love affair with Nazism never really really ended. They tried to save them as best they could. Um, but so Carl Schmitt, the legal theorist behind the Nazi regime, wrote: "Sovereign is he who decides on the exception, the exception to the rule of law, the exception when it's all dangerous, when it's an emergency. This is a case of extreme peril, a danger to the existence of the state." The state of exception is so perilous, it cannot be circumscribed factually and made to conform to a preformed law. Okay, this is like, this is very, very, very serious. It's a danger. The state is in danger, and this is so perilous for us that you can't even expect the, the state to, the, the, the way that the state handles this, to conform to any laws. Basically, all bets are off. You got to allow the state to do whatever it deems necessary because it's an emergency. And of course, and, he's talking about communism. Yes, specifically. It, yes, a socialist kind of uprising or revolution in Germany. They were terrified of this, and how could they forestall this? Which it's you know, what if socialists just took over the um, organs of the state as they existed? But to him, this it's that it's so clear that that is uh, unacceptable that it's not even it, it's not even discussed. It's just a catastrophe waiting to happen. It cannot be allowed to happen. Uh, the limits to democracy you can't have it and so you need the exception so he joins the nazi party and you get the fuhrer principle and the fuhrer and all of this so and, and, uh, and then they immediately in the, in the 30s start throwing communists into concentration camps who are the first people which is exactly this premise like the right. communist threat is going to destroy germany therefore that the nazis insisted that they needed to imprison communists and then it continues to expand and the threat becomes larger and the idea of the peril grows and other groups are included. That's how it always works. Right. And the Jews become, I mean, a, a, a scapegoat. Uh, you, you, but the real, the real raison d'etre of Nazism you see in the early stages where they go and wipe out the left. That's why the fact that they were willing to do that is why the German establishment supported them. It's why we can say fascism is capitalism in crisis. 
uh, because cap capitalism and capitalist societies have to date not allowed uh, socialist uh, political formations to become sovereign in, in advanced uh, democracies. That's just uh, the way of it. And so you really can't say whether Karl Marx's economic prescriptions had much value because they've never really been attempted. You've never had an advanced country really become completely socialist, uh, you know, uh, uh, as a regime. So Schmidt was not a, a person who wanted to let that happen. The Nazis weren't going to let that happen. So Yeah. And the reason I just wanted to emphasize that so much is because you can see a direct parallel into that ideology that the Nazis and Carl Schmidt used to justify their crackdown on communism and McCarthyism and COINTELPRO. I mean, it's essentially the exact same ideology against the exact same target. The tactics are not exactly the same, but it's very similar. Well, this is why the, the Axis Pact, the treaty, you know, the Axis nations, this was called the anti turn. It's just the German smushing of the word anti-communist international. That's what it was. And then after World War II, the U.S. recruits the, the butchers that survived, the Italians and the Japanese and uh, German elites, and they save much of the actual economic establishment as well in all these countries, and they use them as, a, as, an, as their own uh, U.S. anti-communist international. So where there's a U.S. anti-common turn well as well, and you see why, you know, these ideas, why Leo Strauss would become so popular among, you know, American foreign policy uh, hawks, imperialists. And Leo Strauss was, uh, you know, kind of an acolyte of Carl Schmitt. I mean, he had uh, he had connections to Carl Schmitt. Carl Schmitt helped him uh, at a certain point in his career. So it's very compatible. And they, you know, they just, the Dulles brothers were very close to the Nazis. There were lots of Wall Street Nazi connections uh, all along. And and uh, also Wall Street, Standard Oil, they were fueling the Japanese war machine for all those decades. They made tons and tons of money off of the Japanese imperial project such that the Japanese kind of knew that they weren't really sovereign as long as this was the case. And so that's part of why they want to expand into the Western colonies in, in East Asia, right? So this is cap the, the, the differences between the European and then American neocolonialism and neocolonialism and the, the fascist eras and the empires they were going to set up were not as big as we want to admit, just like the differences between the liberals and like, you know, the Hobbesian idea of sovereignty aren't as big as we as we would, would say, uh, or as we would want to believe. So for, for Schmidt, uh, basically, the, the, core, the other part of it is that he, he is sovereign who definitely decides whether this normal situation actually exists. That's a corollary to this. You're sovereign if you're the one who says, okay, there's an emergency. But a corollary to that is you also are sovereign when you're the person who says it's not an emergency. And with exceptionism, what you have is basically the state saying it's never not an emergency. We always, it's always an emergency. And the proof of this is that when the Cold War ends, there are some people, even some relatively conservative people like Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who are saying we could get rid of the CIA now. This is kind of not really something that should be part of the American experiment in governance, but they don't. Policies don't really change because the emergency is so useful and necessary for running an empire that you're never going to, the sovereign authority in the United States is never going to say the emergency is over. Because if you do, then you have to start following the laws. And that's the last thing the U.S. wants to do. So what I what I write to summarize Schmidt here is uh, constitutionalist liberals can at most regulate the exception as precisely as possible and endeavor tantamount to legally defining the circumstances that entail the law's negation of itself. And that would seem to be the Schmidtian, uh, you know, logic. And that's the logic that plays out in the United States. Yeah, Aaron, what I love about this explanation, his historical, theoretical, philosophical explanation of this kind of authoritarianism that's at the heart of liberalism, is that if you look at U.S. history, you can see countless examples of this again and again. And we see the contradiction that emerges between the rule of law and security, right? And we can kind of put security in scare quotes, whatever so-called threats to security are deemed to be, whether that was, you know, indigenous peoples, uh, slaves rising up against slavery and rebelling, communists, uh, whatever it is, you know, in the particular era. So how do these liberal regimes, you know, the U.S. government, these political scientists, these philosophers, how do they rationalize that conflict, that clear blatant conflict between their insistence that their liberal order is based on the respect of the rule of law, the international rules-based order. 
with the understanding that they always have to make these exceptions on behalf of their so-called security. How do they try to reconcile that clear contradiction? Well, rhetorically, they avoid reconciling it by just not talking about it. Okay, so there are many uh, elements of statecraft that are just ignored or not discussed. And the, th these are related to the things that we've talked about, parapolitics. So how do, we, how do they resolve the conflict between the rule of law and the security imperative? Uh, through parapolitics. I mean, this is how do you get top-down rule when you're not allowed to because you live in a constitutional democracy? You just do, you, you commit crimes with cover stories and then you lie about them and you say it's national security so they can't be investigated and the press is owned by the same people, the same class of people that benefit from the states and you know the imperialism. And so it's like, it doesn't happen. So one way it's resolved is through parapolitics, covert operations, top down, dark power being exercised in ways and then denied uh, that, that it even happened. And cumulatively, this gives us a, a counterfeit history in the United States. So we don't really understand why the Cold War starts. We don't understand what was really guiding McCarthyism. You, know, you get cover stories for everything. Cover story for the creation of the military industrial complex and the huge military, you know, the huge military buildup is that the Soviets are aggressive and want to expand. But they know this isn't true. But this is, a, you know, an example of this deep politics or parapolitics is whole political I, uh, realms that are not discussed because they're delegitimizing. And you have um, the, you know, the coups in the 50s, starting with Iran and Guatemala. Uh, you have the surveillance of, of leftists in the 1960s, anti-war people, and so on. Uh, chaos, COINTELPRO. Uh, you have uh, under you have these this Watergate mystery, which is quite bizarre. You have the Kennedy assassinations. You have all these things that are seen that are related to parapolitics. That you have this dark power exercised in a way that's deniable, and because of the state denies it, and because the prestige media and academics deny it, and public officials deny these things so much, then it becomes, you know, stigmatized as like conspiracy theory or whatever. Even though we know that the CIA has a huge covert operations budget on top of whatever extra dollars come in from the drug trade, et cetera, like we know that they have these, that they do these illegal, they have a lot of money to spend on doing illegal things secretly and then with cover stories that they lie about right but if you say that hey i think that, that that the government was doing something secret and illegal and that a cover story has been deployed to lie about what happened then you get called a conspiracy theorist and it's oh that's not you must be wrong because that's a conspiracy theory even though by any rational definition the government has a billion dollar budget for conspiratorial chicanery okay so this is how liberalism manages to deal with these things the exception being able to do things that are illegal and then deny it. That's parapolitics. And deep politics is just a, a bigger, you could think of that as a bigger part of parapolitics or a bigger, more expansive way to look at all these things that are just not discussed. Uh, and so we, we can't deal with them. Now, Ola Tanander, the academic at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, he talks about Schmidt and how liberal political science can't deal with uh, the exception and the dark power that is represented in the deep state. So he kind of sums all of this up uh, in the context of Carl Schmitt. He says, liberal myopia has made political science into an ideology of the sovereign because indisputable evidence for the existence of the sovereign is brushed away as pure fantasy or conspiracy. So here we're talking, when we say the sovereign, we're talking about this sort of deep state or the ability to decide when the exception is. And in the US, Carl Schmitt said, this is what the government needs to have. And you need like this leader. So you get the Fuhrer. That's what happens in Nazi Germany. In the American version, you still have this sovereign that can act in a top down dictatorial fashion, but it's because of the liberal mythology, it has to be denied. And so it's brushed away as paranoia. Uh, fantasy or conspiracy, and then to make it seem even crazier, I, I would think that uh, that they put out the, that you have these different commentators who are there to like seem extra crazy, like Alex Jones and stuff, so that it's like, oh yeah, that's just the, the government. Oh yeah, the government's doing all this crazy stuff. No, that's crazy talk. And this is a uh, this is the way that they're able to do it: parapolitics and uh, clan the clandestine state and just whole realms of policy that don't get talked about.
Yeah, and and we're talking about these these people from the 40s, 50s, 60s, your sort of classical liberals that I think the New Deal brings about uh, uh, some openness to to like democratic rule over property. But you brought up that idea earlier of life, liberty, and property from from Locke, and over all of that is property. The third one is the most important there. It will always be the priority. And when we talk about the quote unquote security of a state being threatened, what you're really talking about is the regime of property enforced for the elites and the protection of the property from the property list. That is the function of the state in their eyes. And classical liberals might have drifted away from that in this era, even though they have this sort of, as you call it, like a kernel of absolutism at the heart of it. But it's not just them because it, it, it extends out today, obviously, in forms like the, the Bush administration and, and the Patriot Act is such a like perfect encapsulation of that. But even your sort of avowed neoliberals that are renewing their commitment specifically and very explicitly to property over all else are very comfortable forsaking other so-called freedoms and, and rights that they like to throw around when it is useful for them. And so you see support for dictatorships like the Pinochet dictatorship is, of course, the, the textbook example that all in all, it will always come back to property first. And, and Locke thought that murder was bad, not because there's something wrong with murder, but because you have a right to your property of your body, your, your body's your property, which is funny because he also was able to support the South Carolina Constitution. So bodies and property are, are an interesting subject for him, but that that it's wrong because you're taking away and, and harming someone else's property. And so at the heart of all this is that, this idea of freedom from and rooted in your right to property over all else. But in the end, it's always going to be, be able to justify accumulation, infinite accumulation on behalf of elites uh, for those ends. And, and in order to justify going abroad and setting up, like we keep talking about, an empire that opens up, quote unquote, free markets in the same way that you said, like these national determination uh, ideas were able to legitimize things like the Arab Spring and, and then be taken advantage of by other people who, who were sort of able to grasp onto that popular energy and redirect it where they needed it. It's also able to justify through it in the exact same way, the way that free markets operate, because it's able to, at its core, allow for accumulation that is that is legitimized by some kind of sense of you're you're free to pursue whatever you're you're going to so i i think that is not just confined to classical liberals is my point that that it extends out to these sort of uh, the people who leave behind the the sort of lockean theory and say we've moved forward from that we have something new they're just as comfortable throwing around a, a authoritarian power and then by definition like you said the ideology of the sovereign by definition, they cannot be authoritarians. They cannot be totalitarian because it's left untheorized. And, and the function of, well, we have free markets still, that is the key, quote unquote, freedom that makes it so that they will never be authoritarian like they see a socialist state being. So I, I just wanted to sort of connect it through past the 60s and 70s like you were talking about. But bef as we close out here, uh, can you tie some of this all together for us? Like, how should we think of these dictatorial elements that work in tandem with what is what we have been calling the public state or liberal democracy? Well, I, I think the best way for me to do this, which I haven't really done up to this point or really in any venue, is to read a, uh, a longer passage here from the end of this of this chapter. Uh, chapter five, the deep state, dark power, and the exception. So this is, I'm going to just read from the book here, but I, I, cause I was, when I reread it, I thought, well, I, I, I said what I wanted to say here. So I'm going to, I'm going to read these, this last three paragraphs here in the chapter. Throughout the history of liberalism, there has been a contradiction between the liberal ideal of public sovereignty under the rule of law and the dictates of security. In fact, this tension extends further back in Western civilization, as can be seen with Plato, who could never neatly reconcile the rule of law versus the rule of the wise. This contradiction is analogous to Athenian politics. Domestically, there was some form of rule by persuasion and consent. In foreign affairs, coercion and top-down dark power prevailed. By the 20th century, state behavior had in theory been legally circumscribed, but in practice, raison d'etat 
could justify exempting the state from legal restraint. Schmidt's theory of the sovereign was meant to apply to a state facing an existential crisis. Such a crisis could serve to legitimize the exceptionalist state, the state unbound by legal restraints. Schmidt could be described as an illiberal philosopher since he attempted to spell out the circumstances under which the state negates its own laws and constitutional rights. He thus argued that the state had the right or even the obligation to negate the very institutions that define liberalism. In Schmidt's Germany, the decidedly illiberal Nazi state emerged from circumstances and actions described and prescribed by Schmidt himself. U.S. exceptionism emerged at the high point of American liberalism. No nation in world history was as wealthy and powerful relative to the rest of the world as was the U.S. at the end of World War II. And yet, the liberal ideal of public sovereignty proved illusory. If sovereignty rests with the party that decides both the exception and the normal situation, sovereignty shifted gradually from the public to the deep state via the deep state's dominance over the security and public states. Charles Tilley found that it was states' relations with other states which forced the evolution of pre-modern politics into modern, pre-modern polities into modern nation states. Similarly, in the post-war era, the full U.S. commitment to global hegemony inexorably transformed the character of the American state. The U.S. evolved from being a constitutional democracy, heavily influenced by deep political forces, into the exceptionist, behemoth, tripartite state. Prior to the late 19th century, the U.S., like ancient Athens, was domestically governed largely through various means of persuasion, compromise, and consent among parties deemed worthy. When it came to expansion and dealing with political others, coercive top-down power prevailed. Beginning most decisively with the closing of the frontier at the end of the 19th century, U.S. elites began creating an overseas empire in earnest. Institutions were created which grew in tandem with U.S. power, such that by the dawn of World War II, the U.S. was poised to assume the mantle of global capitalist hegemon. The general character and institutional framework of the post-war world order was crafted by deep political forces through a planning process that began prior to America's entry into the war. These processes led inexorably to the transformation of the American state and to the de facto abrogation of the rule of law, exceptionism, legitimized by myths of American exceptionalism. Well, I think that's a good note to end on. Excellent quote. Uh, this was part 11 of the Empire and the Deep State series. And it was the last, I think, uh, very theoretical episode because after this, this series, of course, is based on Aaron's book, American Exception, Empire and the Deep State. After this, we start going to chapter six. And from now on, it's mostly history. So we've spent the last 11 parts here, the last 11 episodes, having a much more kind of theoretical analysis with history, of course, of the U.S. empire and the deep state. And I think for the most part from now on, we're going to be mostly reviewing a lot of this history of the U.S. empire and the deep state. Of course, there's going to be theoretical elements, but I hope people have enjoyed the series so far. At some points, maybe it was a little heady, but I think it's going to be worth it. And I'm very excited to, to move forward and talk about a lot of this history. Any, any final thoughts, guys, before we, we wrap up? I'm excited to get into the history because the wading through all of this theory was a was quite a, a lot of work I had to put in over these over years to to look at these at these issues and the the use of it the utility of it is that it allows you to understand history and so I'm I'm very excited to lay this out and we can try to replace the counterfeit history with something closer to a real history of the U.S. empire. Right, and and chapter six is my personal favorite from the book, so I'm I'm looking forward to it, and I I hope people enjoy these next few chapters. So yes, in many ways, this is the end of the beginning, but there's still a lot more to come. So I want to thank everyone who listens or watches this program. There will be many more episodes coming soon in the Empire and Deep State series. That's co-produced by the American Exception podcast, hosted by Aaron Good and Seamus McGinnis. And it's also co-sponsored, co-hosted by Multipolarista. I'm Ben Norton. Uh, you can support the show at patreon.com slash American Exception and also patreon.com slash Multipolarista.
and we'll see you all next time. Thanks a lot.